Our next speaker is Jonathan Clark, and he's giving a talk about rudder. I hope I pronounced it right. Yep. Enjoy. Okay, great. Enjoy it. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Jonathan Clark, um, like you just said. Um, I know that at the same time as my talk, there's a really interesting sounding talk about how they do support at GitHub in the next room. So if you do want to go and see it, I do. <laughs> um, feel free. Uh, it looks pretty awesome. Last chance. Okay. Um, so who am I to be talking about? Rudder. Um, I currently work at Normation, which is a company I co-founded in Paris five years ago. Um, I'm the product lead, which basically means I decide what happens, what doesn't happen um, in Rudder. I, I used to be a sysadmin. Um, I kind of still am. If you are one day, you, you stay it. Um, I just don't do that much sysadmin day to day anymore. I do a lot more running a company type stuff. I've always worked in free software, um, pretty much my whole working life. Um, in particular, apart from Butter, there was CF Engine, of course, which we use, um, OpenLDAP, and some various other LDAP tools, LSC, for example. Um, and in, when I'm not doing software, I organize events, um, particular DevOps days in Paris. If any of you get the chance to come over in end of November or beginning of December this year, we're going to have a great DevOps days event there. Um, it would be great if, if some some of you guys came. And LAPCON in another world. So, what are we going to be talking about? We're going to be talking about Lego. Um, absolutely not configuration management. I'm sorry, that was a lie. <laughs> Definitely not going to happen. Um, but actually about, about Lego. Um, just a quick reminder for those who haven't done any Lego for years. The idea is that you start with the blocks on the left that look like building blocks, and you end up with something like that on the right. Um, it's kind of akin to config management uh, in a way. You start with some very small building blocks, and then you achieve a huge infrastructure that does stuff. Um, maybe you sell stuff on a website. Maybe you run internal IT, keep desktops going, whatever. But you achieve stuff using basic building blocks. So how did we come to build Rudder? Um, we're a bunch of consultants doing operations, sysadmin stuff, um, a lot of basic infrastructure stuff, you know, central LDAP servers, web servers, mail servers, that kind of thing. Um, I've worked in small companies, two people, large companies, hundreds of people, thousands of people, and huge companies. Um, I made a separate section there because one of the companies that I did some consulting at had 120 sysadmins writing CF Engine code all day long, full time. So they go in this huge category, and the others just go in the large category. Um, we've been doing that for five, ten years, um, and we always got the same feedback, the same final conclusion of going in and saying, yeah, we should do some automation, we should do some config management. And what people said, um, two things. First thing is automation rocks. Um, configuration management is the way to go. Um, I think we all know why here. Um, actually, quick question. Who here is already doing some kind of config management in their company or personal time, whatever? Okay, so a majority, great. And the traditional reasons behind this are you want to save time. You want to install that second, third, fourth box a lot more quickly um, than you would if you were doing it manually. Okay, makes sense. You also want to be more responsive to changes. Someone comes along and says, hey, can you change the DNS server on all of the machines? Yeah, using configuration management. You can do that very quickly. It's easy. Um, you also want to improve reliability, so save people making errors, um, make sure the configs are the same across all the servers. Okay, nothing new. And you want to be able to manage one server or hundreds of thousands of servers in the same way. Great. So far, you knew this. But um, configuration management is not easy to get everyone convinced by. Um, what we often see is that there's going to be one person or two people, probably some of you in this room here, um, pushing configuration management, saying, yes, we should do this. Um, but actually, getting the whole of the rest of the team or the company, if it's an IT company, on board is quite hard. Um, some of the reasons that I've seen um, is that learning any kind of config management tool is pretty hard. It's a steep learning curve. Um, there's lots of new concepts like desired state, convergence, um, item potence, 
um, try and tell someone who doesn't want to learn your tool that they need to understand what iimpotent is, then learn a language, then start doing some stuff, and then they can go and configure the SSH server that they already know how to configure. Not, not usually a very good welcome. Um, so one of the second points here is actually the lack of motivation. People say, well, OK, sure, um, your tool sounds great. Uh, I get all these benefits, but why would I do it? Why, why is this my problem? Um, maybe I don't really care. Um, I think we've all seen these people. Maybe they're coworkers who are just angry. <laughs> that happens. Maybe they're people who are really good at something else. You know, um, take the security guy or the DBA guy. You know, if he's really, really good at optimizing his database, I'm going to say PostgreSQL because this is an open source conference, but maybe it's Oracle. Who knows? Um, then he's good at that. Should he have to go and learn a config management language syntax like CF Engine, Puppet Chef? I don't know. I don't think so. And he probably doesn't think so. And last but not least, there's frustration. Like, okay, I agree. I'm going to go and learn your tool. I'm going to jump through the hoops, I'm going to figure out item potence, all these things. Um, but actually, uh, it takes so long. Oh, you've got to learn the language, you've got to write these things out, oh, you do it. And then I could have just SSH'd into the machine and changed the parameter I wanted to change. It would have been so much easier. Um, so you kind of end up like this kid in the middle of the Lego. He's trying to build a house, um, but there's a, a lot of Lego around him. And he has no idea where to start. Is that a feeling that you have ever recognized, those of you who have set up config management in your company, recognized in your coworkers, in someone saying, yeah, I'd, I'd like to help, but I just don't figure it out? Anyone here? Yeah, I thought so, yeah. <laughs> OK. So here I am saying it's really hard um, for other people to do it, but still, it works, right? Um, lots of us are using config management every day. Lots of us have automation. Um, the whole world is out there shouting, let's do automation. This is the way to do it. Um, there's a whole movement, um, the DevOps movement. It's not just about automation. There's a lot of other things in there, culture, measuring, sharing. Um, but automation is one of the key points in there. And they, the whole world is saying, let's do automation. But it's difficult. So how come sometimes it works? I think the answer is this guy. Um, there's usually some kind of a hero in the company. That guy who is willing to work extra hours, who's willing to work around the bugs in the latest development version of whatever config management tool you're using. That guy who doesn't mind if he gets called up in the middle of the night because it means that he solved the problem and therefore the config management tool is going to go ahead. He's a hero. He is. Um, we've all been there. Um, well, I don't know if we all have, but <laughs> we've all been woken up at 5 a.m. when we didn't want to be, that's for sure. But he's actually in a pretty hard position, right? Uh, he's the guy who gets this call that says, hey, you know, I'm trying to set up this SSH, Postgres, whatever, in config management, but I can't do it. Can you help me? Of course I can. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm not going to say no to help you with something that I introduced and I'm the expert on, am I? Yeah, of course. Um, Kind of less fun when you get that call in the middle of the night and the guy's just doing the monitoring checks, like, oh, this came up red. Ah, oh, probably related to config management, right? Yeah. Yeah, let's blame it on that guy. Let's ring him up. It's 5 a.m., you know? <laughs> let's ring him up. He's not going to care. Can you help me? And of course, you're going to say yes because, well, it's 5 a.m., you've been awoken. Why not? Why not fix it? So basically, you end up in this situation that the uh, XKCD comic describes pretty well. Um, which is obviously a scientific proof of what I just said, because it's got graphs, which means it's scientific. Um, what's supposed to happen when you automate is that you work, and then you do extra work to automate, and then in the end, um, the automation tool does it all for you. You have free time, you can go and drink beers, go to conferences, whatever. What really happens is that you do extra work to write the code, um, and then it doesn't actually work the way you thought it should work. So you debug, and you actually do even more extra work. And then you think, ah, I didn't do it right. How about I do it again um, and just kind of change the whole thing? So you do even more extra work. Um, and then you have to change other things because the work is piling up during the time. So you have to integrate them into your code as well. And then basically, you end up just developing your config management tool, your automation tool, forever. And you never get that free time that whoever promised that to you promised you. Um, so you kind of get frustrated. Which just goes to show that the guy who is doing this configuration management hero 
is indeed the hero. He's got a full-time job keeping up the automation tool. Who here has actually got a full-time job running automation in their company? Okay, it's not too many, but there are some. I, I raise my hand, but then I, I actually work on making an automation tool, so maybe that doesn't really count. So, um, I think this is a problem. I think it's a problem in that it's definitely something we need to do. We need to automate things. Um, in the current day and age where you can spin up 100 cloud instances in two minutes if you want to, yeah, you need automation, definitely. Um, in the current day and age where security threats happen, SSL problems, just random example, you know. Um, you need to be able to patch things quickly. You need that reactivity. Um, so we need to be doing automation. We need to be doing config management. Um, but it's hard. It's hard to get everyone involved. Sorry. So how can we help this? Going back to the issues that I mentioned earlier that said it's hard for our coworkers to actually get involved. First thing we said is there's a steep learning curve. What can we do about that to help them? Obviously, we could train them. Um, what we want to do is get rid of the steep learning curve, I think. Yeah, we need training. Um, there's public training happening right next door at the moment. Um, jump in there if, if that's going to help. Um, I don't know if you're allowed to do that, but <laughs> you could try. Um, I think that we should be separating how we do things and what content there should be in there. If we think back to our um, database admin, our DBA for a second, what he needs to be doing is setting up the right cache um, sizes or the right Postgres configs in Postgres. He doesn't need to be writing Puppet code or CF Engine code or whatever to do that. He just needs to be able to say, hey, change the cache size from 256 megs to one gigabyte, something like that. So it's exactly what people started doing in websites what is it, 15, 20 years ago now, using a MVC control of you model um, thing. Um, you have the content, that's an author, you know, an editor, a, a communications person writes the content, and the way the website works, the PHP code or the Java code or the Python code or whatever we use, is completely separate. You don't want the person who writes your, your blog to be writing PHP code to write a blog post to you then, that makes no sense. Um, so it should be the same in config management. Why are we mixing together the values and the code? We shouldn't be. Um, I don't know if anyone here attended the talk that was in this room yesterday, which is uh, about solid, solid principles in config management. It's exactly what they were saying. Separate the content from the way you do it. So that's the first approach. The first thing that I think we should be doing. <coughs> the second is the problem is lack of motivation. Why should anyone who is not you know, really into config management, sysadmin in a company, be caring about this? Why should they be learning? Um, what do they have to gain from that? Well, um, let's give them something to gain. If they don't have a benefit from using it, of course they're not going to use it. Let's give them something. I think that we should be showing the users what they're achieving. Um, we know that when we write a puppet recipe or um, sorry, a puppet module, a chef recipe or whatever, we're going to change a config across 10 servers, 100 servers, 1,000 servers. That's amazing. You know, It's really powerful. Um, let's show them how amazing it is. Let's show them what actually happens when you change a config. Let's give them some, some reports, some graphs. Show them what's happening um, when they change something. And the third one was frustration, saying, yeah, I'm, I've got all these Lego building blocks. I'm not actually achieving anything quickly. It's slow. I'm, ugh, I'm fed up. Let's get rid of that one. And let's give them an easy and a quick way to achieve success. Um, ready to use config techniques and your own ones, your in-house ones. Let's give them to these users so that they can just add in the values, add in the content um, that we didn't have earlier. Okay, so I know all that sounds rather abstract uh, for now. Um, I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page uh, with the understanding here. Um, but it sounds like at least a few of you have already encountered these problems, so I guess, I guess you, you identify with them. Um, so what have we done 
I mean, this is the topic of my talk, right? It's rudder. Um, what is rudder and how are we trying to solve that problem? What we're trying to do is make config management more easy um, and increase the amount of people that use it. The amount of people, as in new companies, start using it, sure, but also the amount of people in one company that are using it. I so often see teams of sysadmins, maybe it's a team of six, seven sysadmins, and only one or two or three of them are actually writing um, the config management code, actually using the tool. Um, it should be the whole team. It should be the whole IT um, department in a company that is benefiting and using that tool. So what we decided to at least try and achieve, you can tell me at the end of the talk whether we succeeded, um, is to lower the entry barrier into doing config management, make it easier to get started, make it easier to use day to day, um, and still keep it just as powerful as before. We have the power now, we don't want to go and lose the power, do we? That would be crazy. And we also want to extend the benefits of config management to a wider population. So currently, people who use config management are experienced sysadmins, senior sysadmins, maybe junior sysadmins on paper that have actually gone and spent loads of time to learn config management. So actually not that junior, right? What about the real junior sysadmins? The guy who just joins the company and is like, yeah, you should go and change the config on that server. Oh, but by the way, you have to edit the config management thing, check it into Git, um, apply the rules, the tests, and what? what the, whoa, <laughs> I can't do that. Um, so we need to help him. And I guess management as well. Um, they need to be able to see what we're doing with that. How many times have we ever seen um, management in a company decide to invest in a tool because it's going to make the sysadmin life, sysadmin's life easier? Not a good criteria. Really not a good criteria. Making the sysadmin's life easier and cheaper, definitely a good criteria. Yeah. So when we build Rudder, we tried to follow some core principles that I care about a lot, is that making things easy and smart um, but still extensible and customizable. So basically we're talking about same defaults. Um, when you install Rudder, you can have it set up and running in two to three minutes. Hopefully this is the case because my demo VM crashed just before the uh, session started. So it's reinstalling at the moment and hopefully in five minutes it'll be working. If not, then I lied <laughs> and we have no demo, but hopefully we do. Um, so yeah, these core principles, making things easy, you should be able to get to changing a config parameter in a really simple manner, it should not be complicated. It should all be plug and play, you need to edit a new kind of config file, sure, just connect it in. Everything is open source, of course, we care a lot about open source. Um, I, know, I know this may sound weird in an open source conference, but everyone in our company and everyone in the development team behind Rudder has always worked in open source. We really care about open source. We have all of our development is open. We talk on public mailing lists. We, everything is GPL. Um, we contribute to other projects. We are, yeah, I think we're a pretty good open source citizen, So I'm trying to say. We're not a public company um, with a product that happens to be open source. It's kind of the other way around. So, um, what is actually Rudder today? Um, it's a tool that is specifically designed for automation, but also compliance. Um, I haven't mentioned compliance yet, but one of the things that we have added in to your basic config management tool is the possibility to find out how the config was applied. Um, you know, how often do you write a rule and you send it out to your 150 servers? Yeah, okay. You hope it works. Yeah. Um, so what we've done is we've integrated a feedback loop so that every action that is checked on a server comes back up to the central point of control and you can tell uh, whether the config is correct or not. It's compliance. Um, to us, it's probably not as important as the larger corporations that actually need compliance. I'm not, I'm not talking Sarbanes-Oxley compliance here. Well, you can do Sarbanes-Oxley compliance here. Um, but just compliance as in I set up some rules about SSH. Have they been applied? We have a web interface to make easy experience for the users. It's not necessary to use it, but the whole point here was to make this easier for newcomers. So a web interface is usually easier. Um, we have chosen to use the CF Engine 3 agent um, as the actual config management tool underneath the hood. 
Um, I'll come back later to why we chose CF Engine over Puppet and Chef, which were our choices at the time. Um, but basically, we did not want to reinvent the wheel. We're not trying to build a new config management tool. I think enough people are doing that already. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we're trying to use something that exists. We're trying to contribute to that tool and make it better as well. That's what we have been doing. Um, we've added in some level of graphical reporting so that people can see, well, compliance, what I was just saying, see what's happening. And to make it easy, once again, all of this is packaged on um, the OSs we support, which are various flavors of Linux, some AX, and Solaris, Windows, Android. Yeah, we use um, config management on Android, uh, which is a pretty interesting experience as well. Um, yeah, and it's all open source, like I said. Anyway, enough talking. Um, time to actually see how this works. I'm going to start with some screenshots because my demo broke. Uh, this is the safe version of a demo. Um, this is what a simple screen in Rudder looks like. Um, this is configuring an SSH service. Um, so all of these variables come up, um, and you can edit the parameters in your SSH service just through a web interface. You don't need to know how CF Engine or how Rudder works underneath. You just can decide that, you know, um, should we have password authentication? Yes or no. Simple as that. Click yes, click no. Um, should root be able to log in using SSH? Uh, no, probably not. We could change that. Um, all of these settings are exposed because someone at some point chose to expose them here and said, these are the settings that I want to give to my users so that they can change them. Obviously, you probably don't want to give this to every single sysadmin in the company. You probably want to someone to have a kind of top-down choice about who says yes, access is allowed or not. Once you've set up these rules, um, you get some built-in reporting. So here we have two sample rules called web database and web front. And they've come back with two different compliance levels. One is 0%, that didn't work very well. And one is 100%. So what we're doing here is we're setting up target parameters. This is a desired state, exactly the same as in Puppet, Chef, CF Engine, so on. Um, but instead of writing the code to do it, the code was already written. We're just injecting the parameters, sending them out to the hosts that are going to try and apply them, and come back and say, yeah, everything was OK. Or actually, um, on the web database, there was an error. If we then zoom in on that um, database section, we can see that there were several components making up that rule. Um, all of these, these last five lines here. But actually, one of them had a problem. It says it's repaired here. Repaired means that it found a problem, changed the file, and fixed it. But from a compliance point of view, we have to count that as a 0% compliance. It means that there was a problem in the past. Next time the agent runs, it's going to be 100%, hopefully. Since all of the changes we're doing are happening in one central place, it's the Rudder server, it could be the Rudder web interface, it could be through the API, it th could be through the CLI, um, everything we do is traced. Exactly in the same way, if you're doing Puppet or Chef or CF Engine, you're going to commit your CF Engine code or whatever into a Git repository, an SVN repository. It's exactly the same thing here. You use the web interface, um, and every change will become a Git commit in a Git repository. And you can even see the differences um, that one commit changed um, when, when the change was made. So remember the example I showed you first with the SSH config here, um, we changed the password authentication from yes to no. And then um, you see in the logs, this is a kind of pseudo XML format, which is kind of weird, but it's pretty easy to read, that the OpenSSH server password authentication went from yes to no. It's a basic diff format, which is to us as sysadmins that are used to reading through, well, at least infocode as sysadmins, used to reading through git diffs, SVN diffs. It's a pretty standard format. But to users that are not used to that kind of thing, it's still a pretty easy format to read. You can see all the settings. Red means it's gone. Green means it's new. Pretty simple. So um, I mentioned I was going to talk a bit about why we chose CF Engine. I'm going to talk a bit about um, four different design choices we made here, actually. <coughs> Is there any CF Engine users here, by the way? One. Yay. <laughs> There's still two of us in the room. Great. 
Um, okay, any people who used to be CF Engine users but no longer are? Two, three. <laughs> okay, not bad. Um, so CF Engine is not a common choice. Um, well, it hasn't been at least over the past five years. There's a few reasons for that. Um, I think one of the first reasons was CF Engine 2, uh, which is pretty bad, <laughs> at least by today's standards. Um, what we should know before we get into this is that CF Engine 1 came out in 1993, so that was 21 years ago now. Um, Mark Burgess, the guy who wrote it, was a, a teacher in a university in Oslo, and he invented the whole idea of config management. He's Great guy to talk to. If you ever get to see one of his talks, I really recommend listening to him. It kind of blows your mind. He's on like the next stage, 10 years after today. Like, wow, OK. Um, so he did CF Engine 1. Um, being a university teacher, he put in open source, like everything that happened back then in universities. And people started using it. And then came CF Engine 2. Um, CF Engine 2 built on CF Engine 1, made things a bit better, so on. And loads of people started using it. Lots and lots of Unix and Linux shops around the world were using CF Engine 2. And it drew a lot of contributors. Um, lots of code went into CF Engine 2. One of those contributors was called Luke Kniez. Um, those of you who use or have used Puppet will probably recognize the name. Um, and he was contributing to CF Engine. And then one day he got fed up. He's like, OK, this CF Engine 2 thing, it's just not good enough. I can do better. And he went to create Puppet. A few years later, um, in open source, the world has a way of repeating itself that's beautiful. Um, Puppet was attracting lots of users. A lot of the CF Engine 2 users moved over to Puppet. Um, and there was one of the guys there who was contributing to Puppet. Uh, it was called Adam Jacobs. You may have heard of him if you use Chef. Um, he got fed up again with Puppet. And he said, I can do better. And he went and created Chef um, in 2009, if I'm not much mistaken. And at the same time as he created Chef, Mark Burgess also said, well, OK, CF Engine 2 was not that great. Um, we can do a lot better now. Let's learn from the lessons that we failed the first time and create CF Engine 3. So when I talk about CF Engine from now on, we're talking about CF Engine 3, uh, which is a completely rewritten version of CF Engine. It has, to be honest, not much in common with CF Engine 2. Um, it came out on the 1st of January 2009, so pretty much the same age as Chef. Quite, quite recent, therefore, by um, standard software terms. And why do we think CF Engine rocks? Um, CF Engine rocks because it has a tiny, tiny, tiny footprint. It means it's very highly scalable. When I run a CF Engine agent, it takes like four, five megabytes of RAM on my system. Um, that's including any shared libraries it has to load, because the only shared libraries it depends upon are libssl. Everyone has that. <laughs> now you have a more recent version. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> Um, libpcre, Perl compatible Redgrid expressions, everyone has that as well. And a small database, uh, a NoSQL database like Tokyo Cabinet or LMDB or BerkeleyDB. And usually you'd have one of these things already. If not, it's pretty small as well. So you can run this, it's written in C. So you can run this on pretty much any platform where you have a C compiler, which is pretty much any platform. Um, like I said, it works on Android, it works on Linux, it works on the BSDs, it works on really old AIX systems, old HPUX systems, old Solaris systems, old, uh, no, sorry, just normal Windows systems as well. Um, got carried away there. Um, and yeah, so it's very fast, really lightweight. It uses an agent that's installed on the machine, and in a pretty different way to the at least the Puppet agent by default. All of the intelligence is on the agent side. So in Puppet, what happens usually is you start the Puppet agent, it looks at what's on the machine, sends that to the server, the server analyzes that, and says, OK, what needs to be changed is you should install this package, or you should edit this file, or whatever. Um, on CF Engine, once it's got the policy, what it's supposed to do, it does never contact the server again. It just looks at it locally and says, oh, there's a package missing, I'm going to do that. This makes it a lot more scalable because there's no impact at all on the server compared to the number of nodes. The only thing they do is copy the policy once, and once they have the policy, it's copied. There's no extra, extra load there. CF Engine is also designed to be very resilient to errors. Um, this may not seem important as a general case, but lots of things don't work pretty often. Um, I know that the GitHub guys are probably in the other room, so I'm going to go ahead and say this. Um, GitHub is down more often than we'd like, right? You know, how many times have you tried to git clone or git pull and like, oh no, GitHub's down, yeah, oh well. 
That doesn't mean your config management shouldn't be applying. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be applying security rules on your system. It's the same for the Debian repos. They're a lot less often unavailable, but it happens as well. You need to install a package. The Debian repo is not available. You can't do it. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be checking your config file. Of course you should be checking your config file. So that's a simple case. A more complex case um, is a submarine. There's at least two different marines um, in the world that actually have CF Engine running on their submarines. So what a submarine does is you put soldiers inside, and it goes off under the sea for about nine months. Well, up to nine months is the maximum duration of a submarine mission. During those nine months, that submarine has no network contact with the Earth. Well, at least not for CF Engine. <laughs> it has network contact for other reasons, uh, which I don't want to go into, really, because um, they're not very fun. Um, and it keeps on applying CF Engine policy for nine months. And then when it comes back to land, they basically plug in a network cable Roughly, yeah. Um, and it goes, oh, okay, I'm back and connected to my server. Here's the reports from the last nine months. And here's the new policy, and then you can apply that for the next nine months. That kind of thing is possible thanks to this, this arrow resilience here. Anyway, um, CF Engine rocks basically is what I'm trying to say with this slide. You can do a lot of things with it. Um, CF Engine is also pretty hard. To learn if you're not used to it. Um, so maybe why not so many people use it. Um, that is getting better. Why we chose CF Engine? Um, it was obviously for the lightweightness. Um, one of the things we wanted to do, I mentioned earlier, was compliance reporting. So being able to check that your security policy, for example, is indeed applied on all your servers. Um, how many people here have defined a security policy in their company? When I say security policy, I just mean you know, the settings you put in SSH, deconfig, or whatever. Okay. And how many of you can tell me right now, or at least this evening when you go back, um, which number or percentage of your servers actually have that exact config? Hey, okay. A few. It's good. I'd love to hear how. Um, so yeah, that's why compliance is important, basically. Get your security policy, you want to know what's happening. Using CF Engine, by default, we run every five minutes. You can change that. Um, so you get a very high frequency reporting about what's actually happening. The way CF Engine code is written makes it very easy for us to do this separation of config from implementation that I was talking about originally. You know, separating the data and the content. Um, no, separating the content and the, the code, basically. So easy to do in CF Engine because they have a kind of functional uh, approach to things. So you can write functions that take parameters and do whatever they have to do. It's multi platform, like I said already, and it can send back reports um, to say what, what happened. This is why we chose CF Engine. Moving on, um, the network architecture in Rudder um, looks something like this. It's pretty similar to any other network architecture you've seen um, for config management tools. There's a Rudder server at the top. It's running CF Engine. All of the nodes that you're running actually only run CF Engine. So if you use Rudder, there is no Rudder specific code running on the nodes. We're just relying on CF Engine to do that bit. Um, we have added a couple of extra things here. The black arrows here indicate the uh, CF Engine protocol. And then we've added um, two other protocols, so HTTP, which is used to send some inventory data, and Syslog, which is used to send the reports. So basically, every time a node runs CF Engine, uh, it's going to output some reports saying, how did this work? And they're going to be sent through Syslog. Why Syslog? Because it's Great. Every single system has it. It's really standard. No one gets scared by syslog. Uh, it's very easy to set up because it's already there. Um, so it kind of just works. You can also build a separate part of your network here, over here um, in such a way that um, if you have network restrictions, for example, you're an ISP, not an ISP, a hosting company, and you have several different customers in isolated network areas, you can separate their configs so that only they are behind their firewall, and it's, it's all separated out. So what does the typical usage um, for Rudder look like? What would happen, um, this is a workflow that we defined with one of our customers, um, was actually for a security policy there is that the management, the guy at the top wearing the tie, would define policy. He would say something like, all of our passwords should be at least 15 characters long, and they should be changed every three months. Okay. 
And he would pass this down to his team of sysadmins and say, do it. Okay, I just, just want it done. Doesn't matter how it happens, that is the policy. It needs to be happening. So what happens the first time you do this in Rudder is you're going to have to do some kind of technical abstraction. Um, that technical abstraction is the how I've been talking about. It's how do I apply a password policy on um, Linux Red Hat 6? How do I apply it on Debian 7? How do I apply it on AIX? How do I apply it on all these systems? How do I apply it on Windows? And once you've done that technical abstraction, that's the how. This is basically CF Engine code that can go and look at a system and say, oh, this is the file that the setting should be in. After I've edited the file, I should restart the service or reload it or whatever. Um, and then you're going to expose some parameters from that, that set of settings. The parameters here are very simple. They're number of days and number of characters for the length. Once you've done that, the sysadmins um, or whoever, basically, can go and configure those parameters using a web interface um, or using an API or using a CLI, whatever they want to use, and just change um, 15 characters, three months in the settings. Rudder will then go and generate CF Engine config, um, which will be applied once on a server and then continuously checked every five minutes by default or less frequently if you prefer, and send back up reports, reports for the dude who just changed it, say, yeah, you, you changed it, it worked, and a report for management that has a nice pie chart in it that says, yeah, your security policy is correctly applied across 100% of your IT systems. And this in effect, is where the separation of code and content happens, is by this technical abstraction. But you only have to do that once. And the nice thing is that a lot of these technical abstractions have already been done um, in Rudder. The final benefit um, that that guy wearing a tie just saw, uh, really likes, but I also really like, is that since everything is going through a central point, you can have a validation workflow. So every time you change a config, instead of you just saying, OK, I changed it, it's committed, now it changed, it's happened, you can have some kind of peer review, just like a pull request on GitHub. You can say, this is what I would like to change. This is how it comes up. And then you get either a coworker or your boss or whatever to come and validate that and say, yes, this is actually how it's going to work. Um, this is a basic overview of, of how these things would work in Rudder. You have a pending validation state, someone validates it, it's pending deployment, doesn't have to be deployed immediately, and then finally it gets deployed. So, um, hopefully I'm going to be able to show you a demo. Maybe not. Uh, this is what my screen is looking like right now. Uh, <laughs> this indicates to me that the Wi-Fi is not working very well. So yeah, like I said, I set up a demo this morning, um, and it crashed just before lunch, and I'm suspecting that this is the cause of the error. Less than one byte transferred in 30 seconds usually means uh, we have no network connectivity. So I'm going to try and do the demo online. If it's slow, please bear with me. Okay, so this is a Rudder interface. Um, it's one of the test environments we use in my company. Um, you basically have two big parts uh, in, the, in Rudder. One is node management, which allows us to see information about the machines we're running. And the other one is config policy, which is yeah, configuration management. And then the other two are administering Rudder. So in this particular case, we have six nodes that are waiting to be managed by this server. Um, these are machines that have got the Rudder agent installed and have run an inventory and said, hey, please, I want to be managed. Please manage me. Give me some configs. Um, the first thing you can see is that these um, machines have sent a very detailed inventory of everything we know about them. We know this is a physical machine. It's got 3.7 gigs of RAM, some swap. Um, it's an AIX 5.3 machine. Maybe not the best example, but <laughs> there are still lots of them around. Um, and we can go and look at its hardware. We can find out the version of its firmware. We can see which kind of processor it's using. We can actually see the serial numbers of each and every RAM um, card inside that machine. 
So we get a whole hardware inventory that includes file systems, the amount of space that's available. It includes network interfaces, MAC addresses, IP addresses. Everything basically you would go and look at on a server um, just comes up. Um, this is pretty much the same role as stuff like Factor in Puppet or Ohai in Chef. Um, we use a tool called Fusion Inventory to do this, which is a Perl, um, small Perl agent that does that. It's pretty nice. Um, it also brings up a list of all the software that's installed. Um, <laughs> this being an IX system, it uses RPM, so they have three RPM packages. Great. Lovely world. Um, any environment variables that are on the system come up here as well. Processes uh, at the time the inventory was run. Obviously, this is not real time. It's not actually contacting the node to, to find out. And any virtual machines. In this case, there are no virtual machines. But if this was a virtualization host, it would find any lightweight containers, LXC, Docker, OpenVZ. It would find any hard, like heavyweight virtualization, like VirtualBox, uh, VMware, that kind of thing. KVM. And once I've looked through these machines, I can say, OK, I'm actually going to decide that I want to manage these CentOS and Debian machines here. Uh, and I'm going to accept them into Rudder. It's going to ask me to confirm. Yep, I'm pretty sure. Cool. Then I have a list of all of the machines that I'm managing in Rudder over here. Um, and I can go and search. Um, huh. Yep. I can go and search through all my machines using different criteria. I can find out any that have a Linux operating system type. Cool, CentOS and Debian. Um, I could go deeper and actually say, I want to say the operating system name should be Debian. OK, that brings it down to one. Um, how about I actually add in another criteria that is that the amount of RAM is less, oh, OK, bigger than uh, 128 megs. Yeah. 128 megabytes. Yes. And it's not. Yeah. OK. It's a tiny, tiny VM. Um, and once I've put all these criteria in, I can, uh, this is currently there's only one machine in there, but I can create a dynamic group from this criteria by doing a group, group that is dynamic, saying all Debian machines with less than 128 megabytes of RAM. And once I've saved this, every time any new machines get added uh, to this router server, they will automatically go into that group. So if you apply any configs to it, obviously, they're all going to get um, the configs just based on that. So this example is kind of stupid. Uh, Debian machines that have less than 128 megabytes of RAM, why would we configure something special on them? Maybe there's a reason. Um, it's a lot more useful if you want to look for, let's say, your HP hardware machines that have an old firmware version. Then you can run a firmware upgrade. Uh, or if you wanted to look for, I don't know, all the machines in data center A, because you need to change the DNS setup, because data center A has a different DNS setup, and so on and so on. All the production machines, all the pre-production machines. All right. Um, so this is the inventory side of things, the node management side of things. Let's move over now to the config management side of things. Um, we have a list of uh, available directives here. So in Rudder, we have techniques. Techniques are the equivalent of cookbooks in Chef, modules in Puppet, um, sketches in CF Engine that enable us to do stuff. Um, there are two kinds. There's what I call generic techniques. You can go and edit a file, any file. It doesn't have to be a file that Rudder knows about. Just give it a file name, and it'll edit it. Um, you can manage processes in the same way, um, all these generic things. And then we have more application-specific ones that are, let's do an Apache reverse proxy. Um, let's do an Apache HTTP server. Let's manage an open VPN client, all of these more specific things. So. We have about, I think, 45 techniques that are available currently um, to do all sorts of these things. I'm just going to show you the OpenSSH server example for now. Um, so let's make a production SSH config um, based on this. Um, you can look through all the parameters that we saw earlier in the screenshot and say, OK, I'm going to force this to IPv4 only. Um, there might be bugs in the IPv6 implementation. We don't want that on our production systems, do we? Whew, crazy. <laughs> um, let's not use the port 22. Security by obscurity. Um, we're going to use 6666. Much more dangerous. Um, 
all of these settings you can change. I'm just putting in random nonsense here in case you hadn't noticed, by the way. But um, don't want password authentication. We do want public key authentication. And I'm going to say that root can log in, but not using a password. So if he's using an SSH key, he can log in. Okay. Um, once I've saved this, it's going to ask me for a change message. So I'm going to say I'm creating the production SSH config. And that message I just typed in, you know I said earlier that any changes we make are sent to a Git repository. So that was actually the commit message that is in the Git repository. Now I have that, I can actually apply this rule, um, sorry, this directive to a rule, to all nodes. Now, of course, is when the network doesn't work. <laughs> Hello? Mm -hmm. Let's try this way. Um, Okay, so this is a default rule that was uh, delivered in Rudder. Um, this is a list of all the directives we've created. So a directive is a specific config um, that we, we created. It's obviously using the code, how do we set up SSH on all of these different operating systems, and our specific values. So this is me and my company having said, this is how I want SSH set up on production boxes. But it's not yet applied to anything. It's just an abstract config. So I'm going to choose to apply that, and I'm going to apply it to all nodes here, um, which is a magic group, a system group that all automatically happens, contains all the machines managed by Rudder. I'm going to say all of them except uh, the Debian machines with less than 128 megs of RAM. So I'm actually excluding, I'm saying all of the machines except some others. Once again, I have a change message, but I can't be bothered to type anything in. And that has been saved. So what is happening now, is that it was very quick, so I'm going to do it again. Um, Rudder generated CF Engine policy, and all of the agents that are installed on these servers are going to come and check in and pull that um, configuration code, as it were, down, um, apply it to the machines, and then send us back a report. Right now, the report is going to be very boring. Um, it's just going to say applying. See up here it says applying. That means I've just changed the config, but I haven't heard back from the hosts yet. I don't know what they're saying. Um, the reason for that is that the agent runs by default every five minutes. So for the first five minutes, th there might be uh, a delay of time before they come and get their configs. So while we wait, um, let me just show you the administration section. There's a lot of settings here that you can change. Um, in particular, the network settings, um, there's just a, a global network mask that uh, authorizes machines to contact you. Any machines not in this network mask will just be completely ignored. That means not everyone can come and check in and say, hey, I want to be managed by your server. Um, you can change the agent run schedule. Um, like I said, it's by default every five minutes, but you could change that to be a lot less frequent. Um, you can choose the exact time uh, when that happens. So if it was like every hour, I could say it would be like 10 past. So. 10 past midnight, 10 past 1, and so on. Um, you've been seeing these messages um, that I've been typing. Every time I make a change, it says, what is the message to associate to that change? If you use some kind of ticket tracking system, this is where you could put a reference to your ticket tracking system. Say, actually, this is fixing issue number 123. Uh, and you can disable that. Or you can actually enable change requests, so the validation workflow I was showing you earlier. Um, and there's other various settings I won't go into. Yeah. Can you also add a, a random number to this time? That not every 5,000 nodes coming in uh, uh, 10 after the Yeah, hour? yeah. That's the third setting that I didn't show, actually. So um, let's say you're running every hour um, at 10 past. And then you can add a random interval here that says, for example, you could have it a random interval, 15 minutes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So <laughs> it's okay. It's a good feature, actually. So this means that if every agent is supposed to wake up at 10 past midnight, they're actually going to wake up somewhere between 10 past midnight and 25 past midnight, because we have this 15 minute, um, it's called splay time in, in CF Engine, which is very useful for spreading the load. Because um, like you say, if you have a thousand machines that wake up and then in the same second all try and use the network to contact the server and send up the reports, it goes crazy. 
Okay, so the last thing I wanted to show you before I run out of time is um, the change logs. So, like I said, every single thing that we change is uh, recorded here. Like earlier, I added this production SSH config directive, and it's damn. I clicked on it. I shouldn't have. So I clicked here. Um, it's been recorded here with all of the details. This was a creation, so there was no diff to display. It's like the whole diff. We can see the diff if we want. It's down here. Uh, it's kind of pseudo XML format that contains all of the settings. Um, and then here, you see that there is the message that I typed in. So what I typed in, if you typed in some kind of um, uh, ticket number, you would see that too. And if I go and look at the server now, oh no, I can't look at the server because it's not, yeah, I can. It's a very long way away. It's like 600 kilometers away. It takes a long time for TCP packets to travel that way, apparently. Somebody has to approve it upstairs. <sighs> that must be it, right? Yeah. <laughs> could could you go on? Ah, uh, yeah. Huh. Uh, it's interesting because I am connected to that machine. <laughs> Oh yeah, okay, here we go. Oh, great. Right, so what I just wanted to show you was the um, configuration uh, that we just changed is going to be in the git log here. Um, you see here I said creating the production SSH config. We added that, and this is a git commit in the git repository that is underneath Rudder. So you could have this synchronized to GitHub, you could have this synchronized to a backup server. If you don't want to use the web interface, because you're that kind of person, you're a geek and you don't need the web interface, I'm one, it's okay. Um, you can just use the Git interface. You can git log, you can git show. If I git show that commit, um, it's gonna show me, what did I do wrong? I didn't do anything, maybe that's the problem. Yeah, it's gonna show me the exact, um, file that was changed. This one, again, is the same very verbose one we just saw in the interface. But if I look at a change, this was, damn, I keep clicking on the wrong thing. Um, this was a change over here. What happened is that we changed the group target from all nodes to all nodes except Debian machines, and we added a directive. Um, I didn't enter any message in that one, but we can still see it in the git log here, uh, which would be here. So if we look at that commit, hmm. we can see, maybe we could have some color. Yeah, I always do that one. Yes. So we can see the diff, um, saying the target was changed from this thing whoa, to that thing, which is kind of hard to read. And the directives were changed to add this one in. This, this is technical um, logs, obviously, at this stage. You've got IDs in there that are pretty opaque, which is why we have a web interface. But still, everything is hackable, as it were, uh, via Git. Um, OK, I think I've showed you what I wanted to show there. I just wanted to say a few final words about extending um, Rudder, because I presented this to quite a few sysadmins. Um, People usually say, yeah, that's pretty cool. I could see that my coworkers would need that, but uh, I'm not going to be in control anymore. I mean, OK, um, how do I actually change a config um, using what, I, what, what if I don't want to use the ones you provided, but only do, do mine? Um, so let's just take a quick look at this graph here. Um, we should look at the nodes on the right-hand side earlier. We make groups out of them. and. We have techniques, which are these abstract modules, which are how you configure stuff. It's the code part of the content and code, um, which are like puppet modules, chef cookbooks, so on. We make directives, and, and we apply the directives, firewalls, to groups. OK. So what we would need to do, let's say you don't like the way we implemented our SSH server config. Let's say you want to do your own. You would change the technique that isn't um, behind that. You want to look at this techniques block here. 
And you can actually write any configuration you want in a technique. If you are that configuration management hero we saw earlier with the Superman um, Lego guy, you can go and write CF Engine code um, to do whatever it is you want and expose just the parameters to your coworkers. Um, you can choose exactly what web interface you want to design using very simple language. That probably sounds scary, and I told you earlier that CF Engine language was a bit scary. So I just want to show you an example of what this actually looks like using this, this framework called NCF that we also created. Um, this is a very simple technique that just installs a package, copies, uh, well, uses a template to create a config file, and restarts the service if it has changed the config file. It's just these five lines. It's very simple to write. Um, final word. Um, the current status of the project is the question I get a lot, so I'm just taking a bit of advance here. We started this five years ago in 2009. I know that makes me feel really old now, but <laughs> it's not that long in software history. Um, and now it's become pretty reliable. We've got lots of big users running weather. Um, we have a user that recently pushed usage up to 15,000 nodes in parallel, which I did not think was going to work, but he made it work, um, contributed to nice bug fixes. And this is what Olo has to say about um, but, uh, and If you know of Olo, it's a code analysis tool um, run by Black Duck. Um, so they say that we have 28 different contributors, 192,000 lines of code. I, I'm quite astonished, but I suspect it counts different branches separately. Um, Well-commented source code. A uh, young but established code base, large development team. And apparently, it took us 49 years of effort. It did not. Like I said, it's been five years. Um, but anyway, that's what Odo has to say. Any questions? Yeah. So um, I'll repeat the question for the recording. It was apparently we're tied to Fusion Inventory as an inventory tool. Could we use OCS instead? Um, probably, yeah. I've never tried. Um, but the way the inventory gets into the web app is it uses a small application called an endpoint that takes the file that Fusion Inventory generates, which is an XML file, and converts it into Rudder's internal storage. So it may well work with OCS format. It should work fine. It should work no, fine. The, the format is almost the same for OCS and Fusion. Great. You might have to patch one or two lines, but OK, cool. Okay. There was another question here. Uh, do I have to configure everything via fact interface, or can I do something on command line? Yeah. <laughs> so the question was, do I have to configure everything in the web interface, or can I use the command line? Um, you can use the command line to do all these things, um, either via the Git um, repository that I was just showing you, or via an API. There's a full REST API. Anything you can do in the web interface, you can do via the REST API as well. So you can script this, um, you can automate it um, with the API or just command lines. There is some shell, or I have to write my own shell? There are some basic shell commands. Um, there's nothing as complete as the web interface on the command line, um, but you could do most things using simple shell commands. Pretty simple, so thank you. <laughs> How do you do service orchestration, like first switch off the three web servers, but keep the other three running, then switch off the first database server, update it, put it up again, and then do the other chunk? So um, it's a very good question. <laughs> it's an annoying case, but it happens frequently. Um, what we would do in this case is that we would just implement that in CF Engine because every, everything that runs on the host is CF Engine code. So we would write CF Engine code that includes the signaling mechanism uh, or the detection to, to the one host one talks to host two or three and detect it like that. Is this theoretical or practical, what you just said? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Did you write such a solution or would yeah. that be an idea to do it? It's both. <laughs> we have written such solutions, yeah. Yeah. That we don't have anything that is built in, that's like a generic technique like the ones I showed you to do that, because usually these situations are very specific to one company or one infrastructure. So I usually suggest to people that you actually have to write your own um, to do exactly what you want. 
Um, what else do you need for synchronization or other the other question uh, other other question? If, could you sync to rudder servers using Git? So could you yeah. just? Yeah, a lot of our customers do that. Actually, they have a rudder server in dev, or rudder server in pre-production, and a rudder server in production, and they do a Git pull from one and a Git push onto the other to migrate the configs up. But the, the users and such is the users are not in the Git. They're separate. The nodes are not in the Git as well. Okay. All of the config configs, um, as in your SSH settings and so on, are in the Git. Okay, and then the users are in in uh, data so structure that's inside of the rudder code, or is it a database that you could share or that you could replicate to the others? So there's there's several ways. Um, one is to use there's a rudder users file that you can declare users in with passwords, or you can connect it to an LDAP database. Well, LDAP server okay. um, and query. And you map the git commits names, so the usernames yeah. of the git commit with, uh, the, you have to have a name in the LDAP or whatever. You do, yeah. It's the same name, let's say. Yeah, otherwise you just use the username, the login name. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thank you. So in our company we have the uh, limitation to not run config management agents uh, unless explicitly triggered. Mm -hmm. Could you do that with rudder, like go and it runs? Mm, it's not configurable directly today, but you could change that so it never runs automatically and just have a remote trigger to do it, yeah. Um, it would be, for me, it would be like 10 minutes work because <laughs> uh, I know the software quite well. If for someone who's never done it, it might be a bit longer, obviously, to set that up. Okay. so. But if we would do this, the uh, the what was it called? The compliance. Uh, yeah, the compliance would be terrible. It would say uh, zero percent the whole time. You're right. Yeah, but you would see the moment it would be uh, it would be done, right? It yeah. Change to one hundred. Yeah. But if you have a frequency of one hour, for example, it will stay at one hundred percent for one hour, and after one hour, it will say, "Hey, the node's not responding anymore." Yeah, okay, you had to change that, of course, that it yeah. didn't wait for one hour and then break. Yeah, and we're actually working on that. This is Rudder 2.10, which was released last week, I just showed you. We're working on this for Rudder 2.11, um, which is going to come out at the end of May, so in one and a half months now. And we're going to be able to disable the compliance mode. So if you wanted to do that, you could say, I just want the nodes to send me a heartbeat, saying, yep, I'm alive, yep, I'm alive. And it would just say the node is alive. Last time it checked the configs, they were okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Why is it seven O's? Ah. <laughs> um, it's Google's fault. There's apparently one with one, two, three, four, five, three, six Google's uh, six O's on Google, and I chose the one with seven. <laughs> yeah, it's not the easiest to remember. <laughs> so, well, no more questions. Okay, well, thank you very much for, for listening and for your questions. <laughs>